Okay, uh, greetings world. This is Jonathan Fight, co-founder and chief executive of Beyond Lucid Technologies. And I am pleased and honored uh, to welcome you to another episode of Sacred Cows and Data Cubes, uh, the podcast for the Journal of Emergency Medical Services. Big heads up to Jeff Frankel, co-editor, my editor. And as always, uh, I seek to have in-depth, com well, superficial conversations with individuals who have neither opinions nor views about the, what the world could be, who are subtle and uh, just generally don't have much to say about, you know, weighty topics of import to our profession. So with that said, uh, I'm, I'm here uh, with an esteemed friend and, and guest, uh, Chief Stuart Mills of the Larkspur, Colorado, not Larkspur, California. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Fire Protection District. Uh, hi, Chief. Thanks for joining us. And my intro dripping with sarcasm. This is going to be a fascinating well, conversation. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jonathan, and uh, thanks for having me. And and I've I've really never known you to be sarcastic. Um, that's, that's, that's that's the first time. I've heard I'm I'm a, I'm about as dry as I am subtle. Um, uh, <laughs> I've em I've embraced the subtle as a sledgehammer thing. By the way, I mean. Well, I, I don't know where I first heard that, but I thought, God, they just get me. Uh, so I think today I want to go through a, a couple of things that are both immediately relevant to you and your department and and sort of take it to the broader conversation. And I want to I want to contextualize this in a in a post from this morning on social media um, by Dale Lober. Um, I wasn't really expecting to do this, but uh, Dale is a, a colleague. He's brilliant. Um, he runs a group on LinkedIn called High Performance EMS. Uh, and uh, he is a, a consultant who really gets into the weeds of the math of things like dispatch models and operational deployments. And, and he posted something that you know looked at the issues that are 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 plaguing our profession in terms of pay rates you know attrition versus retention uh the the question of becoming essential versus non-essential all that and i couldn't help but chime in and i just want to intro with this and then i'm handed off to you to introduce yourself to the world but i truly felt that this article <laughs> while well-written and well-intentioned, did nothing helpful. And the reason is because it's a news article that, again, tells everybody what they already know, which is that people are frustrated, that people don't feel they make enough money, that people want to be considered essential, but they also want to have a career that's a stepping stone, which I find to be a paradox, because how can it be so essential if it's on the way to something else? Right. Uh, so... When I think about what you are doing and what sparked this dialogue, one of so many that you and I have had over many years, and I value every one of them, uh, but you have some really unique ways of looking at how to empower your people. And I think that's something I've tried to make a trend lately. And some of the uh, some of the other discussions I've had is with leaders of agencies who who understand that burden and appreciate it and have bent their careers around the burden of leadership. Um, but I think what you have done, and this is where we'll, I'm going to put this out here. This is the intro, long intro to what we'll talk about. But you have shared that burden with your people in a way that I have really not heard anyone, and include, including some of the best leaders in this business that have certainly have lieutenants around them, right? And that, that do a wonderful job uh, and, they, and they do you know, empower them, but you have taken that down to the level of the individual contributor to your agency. Uh, and I was very inspired when you told me that. So I think you might recall, you mentioned this to me kind of offhanded at Starbucks. And I said, we're, we're gonna need to talk about that because that's, that's a level of inclusion in your thought process, in your management process that I think if more, the more managers of of agencies and more leaders of of people did that, there would be much more understanding about why people are being asked to do what they're being asked to do, and that would solve a lot 
of the challenges in this profession, everything from data to economics um, to, you know, people wanting to come in and stay because they feel like they're a part of the organization. So um, tell us about yourself. That, I said, that's where I'm going to go. Tell us how you got here. Tell us, you know, start from, from when you were a wee boy uh, and, and bring us to now. Okay. All right. Um, well, of course, you've already introduced me. My name's Stuart Mills. Um, uh, like a lot of people who live in Colorado, I'm originally from Texas. I was born in a little town called Kermit, Texas, um, actually named after uh, President uh, Roosevelt's brother. Can you hear me not okay? Not the frog. Yeah, is it not, not the frog? No, not the frog. No. No. The no. Kermit or... Roosevelt. Um, Kermit is in uh, Winkler County, <clears throat> and it's about five miles away from Wink. And um, those are the only two towns in, in the, the uh, whole county. Um, used to be in Oil County, but uh, obviously things dried up uh, over the past several decades. So um, I haven't been back there, but my understanding is uh, there, there's not a whole lot there. But anyway, um, with that being oil company and get, or oil country and, and gas country, um, my father was in the business. Um, he worked for El Paso Natural Gas Company. Um, when I was about six years old, he got a job with the Iranian National Gas Company. So we moved to oh. Tehran. Um, really? I, I didn't good, know that. Yeah, I spent a good portion of my childhood there. Um, you speak great Farsi? Place to live. A little bit. Uh, wow. I, I remember certain words, um, but uh, I, I can't hold a conversation anymore. Um, okay. A lot of the Iranian spoke English. Um, uh, sure. Some spoke English well, some spoke broken English. Um, so I was, I, I could I could hold a conversation with most Iranians um, in half English and half Farsi. So this was before the revolution, I assume. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we got out before that. Um, wow. Anyway, after that, uh, back to that. we, uh, uh, decided we wanted to move somewhere where we could ski because uh, skiing, believe it or not, in Iran is better than anywhere I've been in the world. Better Seriously? than Colorado. Seriously. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to come back um, to all this. This is great. I love it. We're making news here. I like this. Okay. Okay. So anyway, yeah, yeah. just to make this brief. Um, oh, good. this is great. Okay. We, we moved We moved back, moved to Colorado um, for the mountains and the skiing. Um, I finished up high school um, in a town just down the road, Monument, uh, Colorado. And um, after uh, high school, I, I went to college for a while, didn't really know, know what I wanted to do. Um, I was a music major um, for about uh, a semester. And I, I figured out that they weren't going to make me a rock star. So I decided to go into the military. I joined the Navy, um, spent nine and a half years in the Navy. Uh, my last four years was uh, shore duty at Pearl Harbor, which was a horrible, horrible um, experience. Um, uh, it was the best time of my life. Um, after that, like uh, I decided uh, since they were going to send me back out to sea for another five years, I, I, I did not want to do that uh, because my job on a ship was working in the engineering spaces. And uh, I, I thought about re-enlisting, and I looked around at all the old guys um, who did the same job that I did, and they looked like they were 70 or 80 years old. And it's uh, long hours, uncomfortable um, work They were condition. not 70 or 80 years old. Okay. So I decided, <laughs> no, nope, I'm not going to do that for another five years. Uh, so I got out, and uh, I immediately got into the fire service, and um, that in was Hawaii? in... 1993. In no, Hawaii, I, though? Oh, no, no, no. I came back to Colorado. Uh, okay. we, I, I, I moved back to Colorado since my family is still was still uh -huh. rooted here. Um, and uh, I pretty much immediately when I got back to Colorado, I got into the fire service and um, here I am now. This is funny. There's all this detail about that. <laughs> You've been doing kind of a lot in the fire service too. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. There's so much there. Okay. A, a little bit about the fire service. Sort of how you ended up in Larkspur. Where were you before? 
Uh, well, obviously, you don't um, fall into the chief position, but you kind of did in a way. <laughs> We've talked yeah. about that. So, you, but I think that actually contributes to the perspective that you have. So, so give us a little. You, you come back from this horrible experience living on the beaches in Hawaii, <laughs> just suffering. And by the way, in all seriousness, thank you for your service on both fronts. Um, You're welcome. So, so you, you come back. You, you've now been suffering, and and you decide you're going to go to the fire service. And kind of what what brought you to where you are now within the profession? Um, well, when I got, what made you decide service, you wanted to be a leader in the profession? For example, I, I started off as a as a part time firefighter um, in in Monument, Colorado, for a, a district. Um, it's, it was called the Woodmore Monument Fire Protection District. A um, couple of years after that. Uh, well, let me back up. Uh, a year after I uh, became a firefighter, I became an EMT. So I was a part-time firefighter EMT. And uh, a year after that, um, my district decided that they wanted to send, send me to paramedic school. So I kind of was on the fast track. Um, I finished EMT school, um, almost immediately went into paramedic school. Um, I worked at Woodmore Monument Fire Protection District uh, for a total of three years, and um, then I have to, had the opportunity to come to Larkspur, and I came to Larkspur um, in April of 1998, and shortly thereafter, I became the EMS chief, um, and I was the EMS chief until September of uh, uh, 2014, um, when I took over as the interim fire chief, and um, subsequently the following January, January 1st, I was given the position of fire chief, and that's where I've been ever since. Awesome. So, I, I think I think it ends up being relevant, you know, with some of the discussions. I, I think this is the most obvious statement in the world that people are, you know, a product of where they've come from. Um, but I wonder, kind of, first of all, how would you say that your military experience, and then, again, it's kind of leading this because we've had such rich discussion around, you You are someone I find is very empathetic, to put it that way. And, and whereas, I think this is potentially a controversial statement, but maybe not. Um, I don't care if it is. Uh, I... I have hoarded the ire of some people by describing fire as a function of mobile medicine. Of uh, and you know there are some people, obviously, who would put fire and EMS in different camps. I don't even use the phrase EMS as the overarching anymore because again we know that about providing care in different places. But when you look at seventy-five to eighty-five percent in most places medical calls, the 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 simple reality is that fire is a mobile medical discipline that does a bunch of fire stuff too. Um, and that's just, that's just a truism, but I think it has played out into some of the, some of the things that you have done, you know, obviously ones that I know about through our both personal and professional relationships is that you have been very focused on interoperability. You've been very congenial with your hospital partners um, in a way that even some of your neighbors are not. And so the idea of being willing and able to sit at the table with healthcare organization as a peer. And I, I'd, I'd love to hear how you think on the one hand, the experience of, again, coming up through a military uh, trajectory, but also coming up to your role from the EMS side, how would you say those things have affected your relationship building interest um, as part of the ecosystem, as part of your, you know, as a, as a way of guiding your troops, so to speak? Well, way back when I was a young man um, in the military, uh, I, I learned quickly about teamwork, um, not necessarily just leadership, but teamwork. Um, and to work with a team requires uh, uh, communication. You, you, you have to communicate with your peers to, to get anything done. Um, and I think that that, along with 
my experience um, of promoting up in rank in the military um, really contributed to my abilities to um, function within the EMS slash fire service. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that um, uh, we primarily do EMS. It's something that uh, most people are aware of, uh, 75 to 80%, and in some places it's 90%. And throughout my time in the fire service, I, I've come to um, recognize that uh, we are EMS agencies that occasionally do fire. Um, that being said, uh, we, we don't fight a whole lot of fires anymore. Um, however, uh, we, we do get involved in fire prevention, which, which, is, which is a very important aspect of what we do. But uh, then again, too, right? I mean, you're, you're preventing injury. Operations day to day. Um, you're right. We are primarily an EMS agency. How much of that have you had to teach people? And when you say that, is that to you, again, is that a truism? Is that the most obvious thing in the world? Or if you got up in front of a microphone in front of your council or in front of a news camera, would that seem to you like anything other than the most obvious statement of statistical fact? Because clearly not everybody feels that way, right? And, and so why is it that some people you think see statistics as the guide of the discussion, as opposed to, and I hate, I hate this phrase, so I'm just, well, tradition, let's just put it that way, right? And the idea that we've been something and therefore we are something. And, and while not irrelevant, just like to say America of, of yore is not the same as America of today, but it's still America, right? Are there, is that an obvious statement or is that a controversy? What would you expect people would say back to you if you got up and said, um, I'm a medical service with a ladder on a truck, uh, as opposed to something else. Well, I, I do think that there would be some pushback um, because uh, obviously we, we still have those people who they like the excitement of fire. Um, they want to be considered firefighters. And, uh, but the real, reality is they are firefighters. And and I'm speaking particularly of our organization. We have firefighters and EMS people. We have EMTs and, and paramedics. Um, and throughout the years uh, with attrition and, and rehiring people, um, most of our employees and our volunteers, they understand that uh, doing EMS is a big part of their job. And I, I think that more and more they're accepting, they're accepting of that fact. And I, I do believe that um, that's pretty much the same on, on different scales and, and just about any other agency. Um, EMS anymore is our bread and butter uh, from an operational standpoint of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so obviously that leads to kind of the heart of what sparked this conversation. Talk to talk to the world, and I let me preface by saying that we're doing this on video, but I I hope people will take notes on this and write you know and and write articles about this. But I am of the belief that the philosophy of engaging with your people that I'm going to ask you to espouse in some detail is vital for people to understand because what you explained to me was a way of engaging with your people to understand the depth of what you just stated so someone shows up you've recruited someone who wants to be a smoke eater right they may not or they may know how much of the work is going to be medical they may not they may have an idea of how the industry the profession is funded they may not Talk the world through your approach to teaching your people what the heck it is you do all day and the types of dynamics that you and by extension, this 
agencies have to navigate when you explain what you do to all the different stakeholders that basically want to put you in a in a pigeonhole that may or may not be real. So again, I, I don't want to lead you to what you describe, but tell me what you did. Basically, tell the world what you told me about how you invite people and even require people in your service to learn what it is it means to run to to understand that debt. Well, the EMS and fire service, um, it it is not a cheap business to be in. And there's a lot of different aspects as far as funding um, the service. So I think that it's very important that people involved in the fire service whichever agency they're involved with um, or employed at, that they have a good understanding of how their agency is funded and what makes the wheels turn. Uh, the hard reality, and I'm just gonna concentrate on our agency, the Larkspur Fire Protection District, the hard reality is that it all comes down to money. Um, if we don't have money, we can't pay people. If we don't have money, we can't put fuel in the trucks. We can't buy trucks. We can't replace equipment. So it all comes down to money. Um, so when I first took this position, I was looking at the budget and we were going through some hard times. We had been making payroll um, on a line of credit. And as I'm looking at this and trying to figure out what to do, um, I, I immediately had to make cuts when I stepped into the position of fire chief. I, I had to lay people off. I had to cut a whole lot of line items out. Um, and then I had to prepare the budget for the following year. Not only that, um, I had to immediately start um, planting seeds with the board of directors and letting them know that we have to find another source of income, or not another source, but increase our income, our revenues in some way. Um, as you know, we can't create a whole bunch of other widgets to increase the profit margin. We just can't do that. Um, with an agency so you don't like make, ours, you're not in the business of making people sick, right? I mean, obviously, we're not in the business of making people sick. We can't, we can't create, um, we can't create calls that we can bill for. Obviously, um, we can write grants. Uh, grants, you, you can't live on grants. Um, so I had to convince the board of directors that we needed a mill levy increase. Otherwise, uh, we're gonna we would have continued going down this road of of hemorrhaging funds, and eventually we would have become an all volunteer agency um, with really not a whole lot of funds for that as well. So, the following year, the board of directors approved going for a mill levy increase. It got uh, approved November two thousand fifteen, and. Uh, things started looking better. So, uh, and just to give you an idea how, of how bad it was uh, when I took this position over, uh, we had $166,000 in reserve. Um, we have had eight, 18 full-time employees um, and six part-time employees that, that we had to pay. So uh, obviously $166,000 does not go far. Hence the reason we had to uh, for several years before that, um, resort to a line of credit just to make payroll and pay our bills. So we're building up this debt. Um, so, and I'll go back to the mill levy increase. Um, that actually uh, was approved and that increased our revenues. And since then, we've been gradually building up um, to this point. Um, instead of rolling over $166,000, um, we are ending the year at a, a surplus of a projected 
to hold on just one second. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to give you wrong numbers. A surplus of three million six hundred and seventy six thousand dollars. I'm sorry about that. Wow. I have a automatic uh, light that switch actually, over here. That actually looked kind of cool, by the way. Just saying. So <laughs> it worked. It worked out. The spotlight was on you, which I think is metaphorical. Because by the way, the spotlight came on you just as you said you have a surplus of three million dollars. <laughs> so it's as if the heavens opened up and shined a light right on you. So. So you turned it around. Um, anyway, I, I I bring that up. Yes, we we do have. Uh, we're going to be rolling over a projected three million six hundred seventy six thousand dollars to use to to fund our agency in the next year. Um, not all of that money will be used. Um, however, there's there's all kinds of external forces that uh, that can decrease the amount of funding that we receive. Um, there's legislation out there um, continually, it seems, to lower residential assessment rates. And when residential assessment rates and, and assessment rates for other properties uh, start to go down, that means the less funding that we get. So politically, we have to stay on top of these things. And um, and I'm, I'm speaking not just for our agency, but all the other agencies in Colorado and, and other states who, um, you know, may understand what I'm talking about. Um, obviously, people don't want their taxes increased. They actually want to pay less taxes. But uh, the less taxes that are paid to us as an agency, uh, the less uh, ability that we have to uh, perform the services that we're paid to do. And when, when our revenues decrease, it's also hard for us to keep people. We're in competition with other agencies. And with us being a smaller agency, even though financially we're quite stable at this point compared to the past, there's other larger agencies in our area who can pay their people a lot more and they are growing and they are hiring people left and right, particularly paramedics. Um, so we have a, a really difficult time with retention. Um, that seems like every month uh, I, I, I'm told by one of our members that they're testing for another agency. And primarily the reason they're going is because they can go 20 miles up the road and potentially make $20,000 more a year starting out. So that is a big problem for us. Um, and that being said, what I like for our people to understand is where the money comes from, how the budget works, so that they can work with me to use the taxpayer's money in the most efficient way possible. So at least once or twice a year um, with all of the shifts and all of our members, I, I go through the budget line item by line item. And not only that, I tell them how uh, the revenues come to us. I, I make sure that they understand what a mill levy is, what an assessment rate is, what a property valuation is, and I also educate them on upcoming legislation that could affect the, the all of those factors. Um, and, and I think it's very important from the brand new person to the person who's been in this business or at this district for 20 years. It's, it's really important. And it's good for people to understand what is allocated to each line item? So, if let, let me sees... let me let me pause let me pause you for a hot second. Sure, I kind of want you know to to bold. I want to bold and underline this point with you because I think this is the part that really struck my fancy. You bring in to your office, or you sit down. Tell us a, you know a little bit about the detail, but you sit down with every member of your team and essentially give them a financial education yes. on what it means 
to run a service. I say this not only in awe of you, because I think that's kind of a magical way of managing, but one thing that I find very challenging about the the idea that you go up the street and you get a $20,000 starting salary month, for instance, is that when we focus on the numbers in that way, when we focus on, if I go here, I get more money. If I go here, I get less money, et cetera. We turn into one of two things. You're either a commodity. You used the phrase widget earlier, right? So at that point, you're just a fungible widget or you're a mercenary. And, and neither of those, by the way, is very congruent naturally anyway, with the idea that 75 to 85%, maybe 90% of the time, you're going to be doing medical things, a lot of which are going to be lifting up people who maybe don't smell great, maybe can't walk, maybe are overweight, maybe have soiled themselves, maybe they're out of their brain. Like, all the other things associated with that, like those are very empathetic ways of doing work. Right? Community paramedicine as a discipline is extremely empathetic. And, and I think it's worth addressing that you are giving people a gift, at least in, as I hear it, by teaching them something that values their intellect, that makes them better at their job, and doesn't simply say, I have more money because I have bigger houses, therefore I'm going to give you more money and draw you in, and as soon as that's not enough money, go on your merry way, and you go from master to master to master. You are, you are actually turning people into folks who are better at what they do. And that strikes me as a fundamental difference that could get lost in the idea that you're walking through line items. But you're giving people a, an education in data and economics and finance that they would not necessarily get someplace where they are one of many and they are expected to simply go with whatever the decision is without asking any questions. Is that a is that a fair summary of kind of what you're trying to give your people by taking the time to walk through this with them in that level of detail? Uh, yeah, that's that's a very accurate summary. Um, and and I've found that uh, to a certain extent it, it makes my job easier because when people understand the budget, and they understand where the budget is um, in any given period of time. Um, if, if they want a new fire engine and I say no, they understand why. If they want uh, or, or any other piece of expensive equipment and I say, well, we've talked about the budget and um, we can review it again. And here's what we have in that line item. This is where we're at in the budget. Um, so I, we, we can't afford that expensive piece of equipment. They understand. Um, I, I know that in my younger days in the fire service and um, even in the military, when there was a, a, a need or just a nice to have thing, um, I was either told yes or no. Um, no delving into the, into the meat of the funding or anything like wow. that. And I, I believe that, uh, again, going back to the the newest member, the newest volunteer or the newest part-time person or the newest career person, I, I think that it's it's really important for them to understand. And, and if they do move on elsewhere, at least they have an understanding of where their paycheck comes from. Um, where the funding for the engine that they're on or the ambulance that they're riding that particular day, um, where that funding comes from. And, and I have found that uh, since I started doing this, and I've been doing it for uh, about eight years now, um, going through the budget like this, um, I found that people are respectful of the apparatus and respectful of the expensive equipment because they know where the money comes from. Awesome. Um, they know 
how expensive it is to maintain uh, the stuff. Um, they 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 know the costs, so it makes life, like I said, a little easier for me, and it also ensures a, a higher level of uh, prudent use of the taxpayer money. How have you found that folks react? You know, when someone leaves, I find myself thinking how ironic that, you know, the the grass, the grass not always greener kind of uh, message goes through my mind here. You know, someone leaves to go to an agency where they might make more money, for example, but they don't have the level of transparency and and uh trust that you are giving them i i keep thinking to myself that radical transparency is almost a radical collegiality or kind of the the principles that you're building this this model on right the the idea that i i'm making decisions but i'm i'm doing it on behalf of a group and i need the group to understand why we're doing it and when when folks have gone somewhere else have you ever gotten feedback from them around what it was like to either go into a place where they didn't have that and they were expected to take yes or no for an answer, period. Um, or have are, you know, are you finding that your colleagues are are adopting a similar model and trying to open the open the box a little bit and you know, let let light in? Um, well, Jonathan, to tell you the truth, I, I really haven't gotten much feedback on that. Um, uh, one thing that I can say when someone goes up the road 20 miles um, north or south, uh, wherever they go, uh, they always want to still be a part of this agency. Um, That's for great. instance, we have, we have two paramedics who are gonna be leaving soon and they, uh, they have both told me they, they do not want to leave. However, they're, they're forced, they're young guys. Um, one of them actually is uh, uh, thinking about starting a family and uh, he needs that extra money. The cost of living is high, but um, both of these young paramedics, firefighter paramedics, um, they, they do want to return here and continue working part-time because they like awesome. working here. Awesome. Well, I mean, that's wonderful. Did that the answer other thing your question? Kind of. I I guess it's just again, it, it strikes me as a as an interesting cultural shift. Right. Again, I because I want to talk a little bit about uh some of what you've done and you've not taken enough credit and enough bow for what you've done in terms of things like interoperability. But I think it's relevant um in that you have inculcated a culture from what I have seen over several years of again transparency interoperability collegiality sort of partnership part of that's a function of being a rural service right and, and you know you exist alongside others but, but part of it is definitely a top-down decision that you know you clearly pointed back to your early career and how it shaped your thinking now it's got to be difficult to go from someplace where your opinion is not only valued but cultured, right? cultured and so far as cultivated, right? Where you you are you are inviting folks into your thought process. And I would imagine, and maybe this is the entrepreneur in me, but you know, on the one hand, corporate environments can be very comforting, right? Because there's a lot that's not your problem anymore. Right? You have your role in the organization and at the end of the day, if payroll is not your job, then you hopefully open up your bank account and hey, look at that direct deposit, the magic work. <laughs> and, and at the same time, if you've gone from an environment where you are invited to know the process to where someone is now saying, okay, buddy, stay in your lane, you know, stay on your floor, stay in your cubicle, you know, someone else is handling those decisions. Thanks. That actually would feel really demeaning to me, to be honest. Um, and so I feel like you set the bar very high. And I've got a corollary question. I'll come back to you in a second on that. Um, but 
but I, I, I would love your thoughts. I, don't, I almost wonder, and again, this is what sparked me to want to have the, this conversation here. I think it's a beautiful thing to invite people who can do so much more to do what they can, right? It, it, it's funny speaking to, to you know someone who's military, but we think about the the words that the U.S. military uses for recruitment, right? Be all you can be, uh, you know, army of one, the, those types of things, and the idea that you are you are encouraged sort of to maximize your potential, right? At least that's the recruitment message. A little different once you get that MOS, but but yes. nevertheless, <laughs> that's the recruitment message. Right? Whereas one thing that, that has so often come up about mobile medicine, and this is more true, I think, on the fire side, because of the, the idea that you're an all-hazards agency, is that you are a Swiss army knife. You're a multi-tool, right? You are trained to do all sorts of things. I, I have found it mind-boggling the amount to which the idea of capturing data, for example, scares people, right? I, I've, you've heard me, post, you've seen me post it, but the allergy to good data that pervades our profession. And yet, people, the same people are totally comfortable with the chemistry of a fire. They get combustion. They get sticking a tube down somebody's throat. They get pharmacology. They get all the you know, physics. All these things are so much more difficult than doing documentation. But I think part of that is because they haven't been invited into the conversation, right? The, the idea of why you do the data this way. Again, I wanna, I'm going to segue a little bit to talking about you and Carrillo and interoperability, or now contextures and interoperability. But you invite people in to maximize their potential which that's a, i think that's a gift right because and, and there are others like you but not a lot definitely not enough but there are some very innovative you know leaders who have recognized that their people are intelligent and they are capable and they are dedicated and i don't care whether or not you have a master's degree you can have a PhD and be a moron and you can have a high school diploma and be brilliant and extremely good at what you do, right? And so the idea that you I, you strike me as looking at people to maximize their ability as opposed to fill a slot, uh, right? Sometimes you need to fill a slot, but that's not a great thing for a long-term career that people appreciate as opposed to help me learn a skill where if, for example, I get injured on the job, it's kind of a reality, right? If I get injured and I have to go find another profession, I have an understanding of how to read a pro forma and a budget, right? I have an idea of how to make slides and present to a council. Now I have people management skills and business management skills and not just put the wet stuff on the red stuff. And in which case, I think we do a disservice to folks if we underutilize them. Because on the one hand, it may be fun, but it's not necessarily conducive to a career that may be varied. And, and you have taken a much more holistic approach. So at least that's my thought. Is that, is that kind of what you're going for? Um, yeah. Um, is that what you're after? Uh, so I don't know. Like I said, I, I, I think it's rare. And I, I, I wonder, I guess my question is more, that seems so wonderful, but it's but it's also not rocket science, right? Again, if we're titling this talk "The Burden of Leadership," you know, I I find as a as a parent of young children who happens to also happens to like Marvel movies, one of the quotes that I find almost a guiding principle of my parenting, which is weird. I didn't think we were talking about parenting today, but. I, there was a line in the movie Black Panthers where the king, now dead, says to his son, a father who hasn't prepared his child for his death is a failure. Right? And, and I think that's, that's it to me, right? I mean, you are preparing people to take over leadership roles by virtue of your activities 
And that's what I see. Tell me if that's accurate. Tell me if that is kind of what you're going. You're spreading seeds all over the place. That 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 is accurate. Um, it's uh, everyone needs to understand the the business side of working for an agency. Um, you know, and uh, some people will understand it a little bit more. Some people will have more or less interest. Uh, but from my point of view, it's it's best to get it out there, get it out there on a regular basis and let people do with it what they will do. However, I can tell you over the repetitions of, um, again, going back to budget presentations and, and going through every line item and letting people know uh, where the money comes from, uh, how it's spent. Uh, there, there's a lot of people that are pretty savvy within this agency and I, I don't really see that awareness um, with people who work at other agencies. Uh, so Why? yes, it, it is uh, uh, because of transparency. And to tell you the truth, I mean, you're, you're really asking me questions that, that I really haven't thought about because to me, doing, doing these sort of things that like I'm doing, or like I have been doing, um, to me, it's common sense. Um, you need to work with people. People need to understand um, what's going on, uh, particularly if it involves a part of their profession that they normally wouldn't be made aware of, if that makes sense. It makes sense. I, I, have, I have this phrase that guides my marriage. Um, I've probably told you before, which is when my wife is right, something is very, very wrong. Um, so, love you, Mabel. <laughs> so, so, so you are you're treading. You're and on it's thin on ice. record, and it's on record and everything. Uh, so she knew what she was getting into. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things that she says that she, that others, of course, have said is common sense isn't so common. Um, but why not, right? Uh, why? What is, is it? Your background? Is it your military experience? Is it that you read books about leadership? Why is it that you have counterparts who are equally dedicated, right? I I am always going to believe that somebody who can puts the bugles on and is willing to be, you know, dealing with all of the stuff that's going to fly at your head. Uh, it's not easy, right? You're not in, in this job because it's a cakewalk. So for there's always going to be some people who are the highest performer. There's always going to be some people who are the lower performer. But why is it that more transparency or an embrace of that challenge, not necessarily on the line, right? I get that as a military profession, right? <laughs> You know, you need to be able to say, we're going into this building, we're not going in, this is our attack model, this is what we're doing. That's not necessarily the forum to have the dialogue. But in the office, when it's safe to do so, why is it that more people don't embrace transparency? Or can that be a takeaway? Because what I also heard you say is that you have spun your agency's finances around. And at least some of that is the result of you getting a collective responsibility among your troops. That's something other people can model. And I got to think that if everybody felt as responsible about the, the, the apparatus and the equipment as your people do, I would never again hear a story about somebody chucking an iPad across the room or running over their tough book or whatever. You know, accidents are going to happen. but but understanding that you have made your people collectively responsible, that strikes me as something that everyone can take as a takeaway, that that worked. And it worked economically. We'll talk about innovation in a second, because I think you also cultivate an embrace of innovation by doing that. But, but it strikes me that that's a problem that everybody can solve, at least to some degree, by saying, we're all in this foxhole together, and you have demonstrated a model for doing that. Uh, so the question from my rant 
is why aren't more people doing that? Why aren't they embracing the transparency? Is it fear? Is it lack of knowledge? Is it that they don't realize it can help? Uh, what What's the takeaway? What's the criterion that someone should look at you and say, if you are not doing this for X, Y, Z reason, let me dispel that myth for you. Well, I, I think part of the problem is people are busy. Um, right. When you get to the level of fire chief, and you mentioned that there's things flying at you from every direction, um, and and it's no different different here in a smaller agency. Um, we have the same problems um, that an agency with 500 employees has, um, just on a different scale. Um, so I, I I think. Probably why you have never heard about um, other agencies doing this is, is, I believe, simply because people are busy. There's there's a lot of things to take care of, um, a lot of things that uh, you have to do as a chief executive officer that uh, people don't really they, they 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 don't see you actually doing those things. Um, and I think that when you're in, in such a position and you're so busy trying to take care of business on a day-to-day -day basis, hour-to-hour -hour basis, minute-to-minute -minute basis, uh, I, I think that doing a training on the budget doesn't even cross people's mind. Uh, but again, from my experience, going through the trouble of doing that and making sure people have an idea of how that aspect of this business works, um, it has made my life a little bit easier. And that's truly the benefit. Well, so I want to right. close this out. Well, I'll say, say that last part again. Oh, I just said from where I sit and the seat that I sit in, that's... Uh, well, and again, I, this is this is to me to to mentor um, our people um, and give them a, a little bit different viewpoint that otherwise they may never see, they may never understand. Well, that, that's an important word that you just threw in there subtly. That that again deserves to be bolded and underlined. And I hope, yeah, you know, some of the dialogues that I have in this forum, chief, are collegial and interesting, right? <laughs> Just a matter of knowing cool stuff that people are doing. I like highlighting that, especially the iconoclast. Um, I hope people take notes on this. This is different. What what I feel like you are giving right now is a masterclass. And, and, and that's something where you use the word mentor, right? You just kind of threw that in there. But, but that's a real thing. And it does take time. Um, but it, it also, in the last few minutes here, as we, uh, uh as we end up, uh, I want to, I want to transition to a very high point. As I, I mentioned interoperability, I mentioned innovation. It's, it strikes me that when you mentor people and you give them insight into what they're working with, whether it's money, whether it's politics, the law, right? I mean, all the different constraints. You also foster capabilities. You know, I know firsthand, you deserve a number of kudos. You were the first, your department was the first in the United States, first, number one, anywhere, to share real-time data from an ambulance with a hospital in a consumable fashion. No one else did it, you did it. You were the first in the state or if not number one, then number two. So we'll, we'll give you either the gold or the silver to, to connect with your health information exchange, for real, uh, now part of contextual. I have seen your people embrace that. And, and you know, everyone's got a learning curve. But we have seen you sit down. We have pictures of you sitting down with people like Tim Noah, who a lot of folks know, right, uh, who very well regarded consultant and, and agency leader and, and whatnot and worked at the hospital at Centura, et cetera. And, and you have sat alongside him with your coffee cups next to each other, right? 
not on opposite ends of the table. Um, I've always been inspired by you in that way. And the idea that, again, it's not, it's not a delegation. You're the guy doing it. But you are creating a model for which, because you've empowered people, because you've given them context, they also have an understanding of parameters in which to innovate. Right? They understand how an embrace of new things. Again, I mentioned at the, at the top of our conversation, uh, Dale Loberger had posted this article that was very much the same old problems. And what I, am, what I perceive you doing is inviting people to try stuff, right? Because they understand the context in which they're trying it. So just like you said, if I want a new apparatus, I want a new truck, but I can't afford that. But I can afford, I went to this conference and I saw something kind of cool or I read an article online and this seems like a neat thing. What do we think, right? Can we try that? And that embrace of innovation has in reality cultivated your relationships with your partners in a way that benefits patient care, right? That, that brings you to the table with healthcare where I was in the room with you, with the chief, uh, I think it was the chief medical officer of Centura Castle Rock, right? Many years ago, right? We know that EMS and fire and mobile medical services of all kinds across the country are complaining actively and vocally about the fact that they can't get a seat at the table. They can't get an invitation to meet with the executives. And you run a tiny little department that somehow managed to do that. That's not an accident, I don't think. I think that is a product of the culture of collegiality and innovation that has been born from this transparency. So, and the comments that I put on the article this morning, just this morning, was if we shift the narrative toward interoperability, not necessarily at a technical level, but a let's operate together, I'll, why wouldn't people want to talk to you? You help them out, they help you out. And as you say, it ultimately makes your life easier because you have now more people in your department who can help you do your job because you have educated them on what your job is, which ultimately means that if you have to take care of a family member, for example, you know that the wheels are going to stay on, right? Or, you know, et cetera. So I find that to be a tremendous perspective but also a product. And how has that, played, again, how is the culture of innovation? Is that something that you have actually sort of sat back and thought, look at the stuff that we've done. And, and do you trace that back in the way that I do? So in other words, are you seeing the same perspective that I am, which is that all of these steps are empowering your people in a way that other people can model? Or do you think that this is unique to, you know, Larkspur Fire Protection District or Chief Stuart Mill's leadership? Well, I, I don't think that it has to be um, limited to the Larkspur Fire Protection District or, or my particular style of leadership. Um, and to tell you the truth, Jonathan, I mean, thank you for talking me up. Um, but uh, right. the fact is, is I, I do what I do. Um, and I, I do my job and, and I, I try to make things run as smoothly as possible. Uh, all the things that I do are, are geared towards that. Um, and as far as our people, we, we have great people here. Um, I believe in empowering them, um, not in the sense of just turning them loose and letting them do whatever they want, but empowering them by giving them knowledge. Um, or uh, introducing them to someone or some course or um, some publication that can that can increase their knowledge. Um, that is what I think uh, of empowering people is. Uh, you give people the knowledge, and uh, sooner or later they're going to be able to take the bull by the horns and 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 do what they need to do and do what they want to do and know how to do it. How um, have you found their reaction? For example, when you recommend something to read, when you recommend something to attend, what has been, 
the feedback, the reaction, the embrace or not of that by your troops? Um, it, it, not varies. Seen it. Yeah. It, it depends on the it depends on the topic. Um, it, it's it, it's variable. However, um, as as long as those things are presented, um, overall it's it's taken well. Um, if not for anything but uh, appreciation that uh, that people believe that me as the fire chief is thinking about them. So we got a comment here and and I think thank you uh, Eric for it. Uh, so Eric Chase uh, chief, if you've not uh, met Eric yet, uh, I don't know if you have if you have it's great you're fortunate. <laughs> um, Eric is one of these folks who does think deeply about these types of topics um has served in many many different roles and capacities in the industry uh has um uh a podcast uh is it it's eric, eric tell me i think it's called uh ems comedy right i believe that's what it's called um, if i didn't get that right eric please give me the eric, ems improv thank you i was close um, so ems improv and um you know i i think what he wrote here is sadly uh it doesn't happen enough because information is power transparency is scary people find it difficult to give others opportunities and so obviously bef before i say anything more uh, chief what, what would you re what would your reaction to that be i believe that uh for some people out there that that isn't that is an accurate statement um but from my point of view, transparency in particular, um, it doesn't scare me. Um, the lack of transparency is what scares me. Right. I, like I said, I think I hope, uh, and let me ask Jeff, were there any other comments, questions, et cetera? Okay. So I want to sort of close out a little bit on this. What I think is, is again, Chief, your words are as inspiring as I knew they would be. So I'm glad that we've done this. I'm only sorry we haven't done it sooner, to be honest. But you didn't drop this knowledge on me at Starbucks the last time we had. So you dropped it on me this time. Um, so I, I think what I find really exciting is that your statements is an antidote to what Eric just pointed out, right? But it's it's so easy to say things like knowledge is power and I don't want to give it to you or knowledge is power and I do want to give it to you. I'm a data guy. I'm often the biggest geek in the room, sometimes not. And I love it when I'm talking, but often I am. Um, the, the 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 thing that I think is so compelling, uh, but what you've just described is it's so easy. Right? The the uh, you know you you said take the time, right? Take the time to mentor. Take the time, do the effort to invite somebody in to look over your shoulder. Right? That doesn't cost anything. Right? It doesn't it doesn't require going out of your way. In fact, quite the opposite. You're probably inviting somebody into your office. You don't even need to go anywhere. Right? So, but what I think you have done today, and I, I'm glad that you pulled up the surplus number because it's one thing to say you empower. It's another thing to say you had $160,000 in the account and now you have 3 million. So you had, again, first for anyone who missed that, you went from, you know, a hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So basically, two people's, three people's salary, maybe, probably less than than the cost of a of an apparatus if you needed to replace it. To having significant, having more money than you need in a year, as you said, right? You will be able to roll forward. Some of that involved some difficult decisions and discussions. But the juice was more than worth the squeeze because 
you know that you are you are meaningfully impacting your ability to accomplish the mission and not only now but it gives you breathing room to be able to say what do we do next right whether that's uh at the service level whether it's at the technology level whether that's at the community level to do things like risk reduction but, but that you have earned yourself that breathing room that so many agencies are struggling with but you're a teeny tiny little service right and when you're kind of i, I always sort of describe it like you guys are you're a small service in the shadow of denver right between denver and colorado springs you got these bookends on both sides but but I don't know that these larger, you know, sort of bigger agencies, I won't say higher power, and I think you guys like we do at, at BLT, we punch above our weight class, right? significantly beyond our weight class. But you have demonstrated that it's possible. And I don't think there's anything you've described today that the fire chief of a city like Denver or Los Angeles or New York or another small town in Wisconsin where Tim Nowak is, couldn't do. Because all you're basically saying is invite your troops to learn from you. And as long as, and even if you haven't had all of the education that you did coming up uh, through your, through all of the aspects of your career, you have the experience of having had these conversations with others and sitting at the table with your mutual aid partners and so on. And all you're doing is inviting people to sit alongside you and to learn. That's what I see. And that seems like a powerful antidote to the idea that transparency is scary when transparency turned out to be the key to turning $160,000 into a multi-million dollar count with breathing. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. Transparency is the key. And with turning around the our, our budget, essentially, um, I make sure that I give kudos to everyone who's worked here um, because everyone played a part. They welcomed the understanding. They Aaron's they didn't up. like the comfortable feeling of, well, next week, am I, am I gonna get a paycheck? Am I gonna have a job? So I was able to educate them on how the budget works, where the money comes from, and what can we do to keep you from not getting a paycheck next week or losing your job. They all took ownership. And I, I believe that even though we're financially stable now, um, people still who who work here and even who are volunteers here, they, they understand um, a lot of things as far as finances that uh, people in other agencies don't. They they well, know that they're not going to get blindsided tomorrow. I think that's the perfect place to pause. Um, you know, it, it again. I I don't think there's anything you just said that somebody couldn't take notes on, and emulate. And you know, you describe me as building you up, chief. I, I the joy of being a journalist is that I get to to call out and highlight what people are doing. This is purely your work and me being able to you know with the help of our friends at Gems. Uh, thank you, Jeff, as always. Uh, and to everybody who's tuning in now and in the future, but it, it is my privilege to be able to shine light, not quite as visibly as when your lights turned off and the heavens opened up on you. Um, but shit, the timing of that was awesome. We have money. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is something that people can learn. And I, I would just ask as a last question, would you be willing to allow people to reach out to you, for example, uh, to consult with you if they want to learn how to do this? Is that something, you know, obviously you mentor your troops. How would you feel about mentoring others uh, who want to who want to be able to walk your path? Oh, I, I would welcome others. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, we'll make sure to tag you on social on this. Uh, again, uh, I would simply say for anybody who wants to see not only how the talk is the, the talk is done, but the walk is done. Um, you have done it. And so congratulations to you and to your team. As you say, it's a group effort. Um, but you know, it it, it starts at the head. Uh, and so 
I think the the kudos certainly to you and to the people you have empowered as an extension of you. Uh, congratulations on what you've done. I hope people will take notes on this, uh, and uh, and we'll we'll talk again. And then to everybody who's attended, thank you very much. I hope you got a, a lot of practical wisdom here. Uh, this is you know not just an interesting story for me to tell, having been in the room for some of these dialogues and seeing what is possible when you know executives at hospitals and executives at the state and so on come together with the 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 boots on the ground and their leadership. It is truly remarkable the magic that can happen. But I think we've got some some real tangible takeaways on things that agencies, large or small, rich or poor, uh, can do to write the ship, grow the ship, uh, you know, and, and be able to explain the value of mobile medicine uh, to the communities that don't necessarily understand how it works on a daily basis. So Chief, thank you for giving people some very tangible takeaways. Um, and uh, we will pause here. Thank you to Journal VMS and to everybody for listening for quite this long. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Stay safe.